everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no-hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin. Bit of news. Unchained is now on YouTube. You can find the most recent episodes there every week on the Unchained podcast channel, and we'll soon be getting the full archive up. Also, if you're not yet subscribed to my weekly newsletter, go now to unchainedpodcast.com to sign up. Within months, cryptocurrency anti-money laundering regulations go global. Are you ready? Avoid stiff penalties or blacklisting by deploying effective anti-money laundering tools for exchanges and crypto businesses, the same tools used by regulators. CypherTrace is securing the crypto economy. My guests today are Daniel Lundberg and Michael Cordner, core team members of Grin. Welcome, Daniel and Michael. Hi, Laura. Hi, how are you? Daniel, why don't we start with you? Tell the story of Mimblewimble, the technology that spawned Grin. For listeners who don't know the tale, like Bitcoin's origin story, it has a mystery at its core that makes the technology even more intriguing. Sure. So Mimblewimble is a privacy-enhancing and scalable protocol for a blockchain. Uh, its, its name comes from the tongue-tying curse in Harry Potter that prevents uh, afflicted from spilling secrets. Uh, it, w- it, was, uh, it was originally proposed in uh, 2016 by a pseudonymous uh, person called uh, uh, Tem- Tom Elvis Jedusor, which is the French uh, equivalent of Lord Voldemort from the Harry Potter series. And it was shared as a text file uh, on the Bitcoin Wizards IRC room through uh, Tor link. The link to the paper was dropped there and then uh, this person disappeared and we haven't heard from them again. And uh, Michael, why don't you tell how that led to the development of Grin? Sure. Um, Well, I mean, as uh, Daniel just said, that paper was dropped. And then a few months later, in around, say it was around December of 2016, someone again appeared on the same channel by the name of Vignotis Peveril, who is another character in the Harry Potter series, who is, uh, I think he stole the invisibility cloak from death. I think that's the reference there. And he said he was had put together a new implementation of the Mimble Wibble protocol, and it was called Grin. And he had the the source kind of uploaded and ready to go. And then the the project kind of kind of took off from there. Wow! Who ever would have thought? Well, I'm sure J.K. Rowling never <laughs> would have thought that her creation would be used in this manner. But uh, I do think the names and the technology do go well together. So why don't you guys describe what Grin is or is trying to be? Okay, sure. Well, I mean, Grin's, Grin's main goal is to be is to be better money. And the, it's what it is, is it's it also builds itself uh, kind of on our on the homepage as a, a lightweight implementation of the Mimble Wimble protocol. So it, even though, I mean, I mean, Grin is an entire blockchain in itself and then on top of just the core kind of Mimble Wimble protocol, there are all sorts of, you know, decisions and things that have to go into the, the building of a working blockchain. But it aims to be very, very, very kind of light and, and as kind of non, non-prescriptive as possible as to how it deals with those two, as to what it is, basically. So, so one of the big important points of the Mimblewimble protocol is that it allows you to verify transactions being valid without having to store the entire history of the blockchain, unlike previous uh, method, uh, methods and protocols of the blockchain. Uh, it builds on uh, previous research, uh, a lot of it made by Gregory Maxwell in confidential transactions, one-way aggregated signatures, coin join, uh, and a new thing called cut-through. Uh, and it basically allows you to uh, store much less data on the chain and, in general, much less information. So in Mimblewimble, there are no uh, amounts. Uh, you don't need to have addresses uh, stored on the chain. Uh, and instead, what you keep uh, on chain is a very minimal uh, set of data, which is basically a set of inputs and a set of outputs uh, that are cryptographically blinded, you could say, and don't really mean a lot to anyone aside from the people who are actually involved in the transaction. This allows for much easier syncing, uh, faster syncing, and less uh, size of the blockchain itself as well, which is why you're getting these uh, scalable properties. Yeah. When I was learning about this, there was something really sort of mind-blowing. It's just like if you really understand Bitcoin, then yeah, you're like, 
oh, this is kind of a better way to do it, you know, just um, with that level of efficiency or kind of the lightweightness of of the blockchain. It just it, it just feels like this was built by somebody who deeply understands Bitcoin and kind of what the problems are with it. So what about the technology captured your imagination? Why, out of all the different crypto projects, did you decide to work on this one? Okay, well, when I first came across the project, it was a few months after after it had been put out there. And I was kind of, the the technologies that kind of go into kind of blockchain development and cryptography, applied cryptography, rather, it's, it's kind of a lot of stuff that really kind of, that I like doing, just kind of from a technical perspective, kind of I enjoy coding on it, I enjoy working on it. And obviously, cryptocurrencies are interesting. And I was kind of looking around for one of them to join, but I couldn't, I didn't really see anything out there that was kind of, I thought would be worth joining at the time. Not, not because the projects themselves aren't worth joining, or joining or because, but rather because maybe they're, they're too far along and there's not much I can add to it. Like I couldn't see myself adding anything to Bitcoin itself at this stage. Other projects out there may be kind of, you know, a, a clone of Bitcoin with a change here and there, but nothing really substantial. But when I came across, you know, Grin and Mimblewimble, it was kind of clear to me that this is something really, really new and something that really had a lot of potential. So that, that's kind of why I, I decided to, to join it and start getting involved in it. And on my end, I've been following the crypto space uh, since, well, I heard about Bitcoin maybe in 2011, dismissed it, uh, bought first Bitcoin in 2013, but what always on the, was always on the sidelines and kind of monitoring and paying attention, reading, catching up on projects, uh, made it through 2017 uh, and all the craziness there. Uh, and there were, weren't really any projects that were appealing or speaking to me. Uh, instead, I was kind of happy being on the sidelines. Uh, and then about a year ago, I found out about uh, this project and about Mimblewimble, and I basically fell down the rabbit hole uh, and just couldn't start stop um, researching it. And I found this, you know, there were some presentations about the Mimblewimble protocol, and that led me to Grin, and uh, I started lurking and reading up on, on the project itself and seeing these uh, developers and development community that was very open, was very focused on building and had no intentions of, you know, making money from it or, or uh, profiteering from it and were purely in it for the technology. And early 2018, that felt borderline crazy and also like a complete breath of fresh air uh, that was really appealing to me and really encouraged me to get involved in the project. And at the same time as well, I was doing some research uh, for my day job uh, back then about Bitcoin transactions and the regulatory requirements around that and accepting and receiving uh, Bitcoin deposits and withdrawals. Uh, it was pretty much at the same time, and it, it had like a profound impact on why I chose to go into to Grin, was uh, that you would, you would see these guidances from regulators uh, telling companies that in order for you to accept uh, payments from, from customers, uh, you need to go through, you need to have the deposits as they come in, go through an uh, analysis tool. Uh, so like a third party KYC analysis tool, like, uh, like, like some of the well-known actors in the space. Uh, and, and based on the score, you can then choose to accept the deposit or otherwise you have to refund it and return it back from where it came from. And this was just mind blowing for me because essentially what this means is that you establish some kind of, uh, it's almost like a credit score but it's about a score of how good your money is. And that made me think a lot about fungibility and, and why it's very important to have fungibility on the base layer of the protocol in order for companies to be able to transact uh, in a way that doesn't create a huge amount of friction. Yeah, in a way it's like, of course, I, you know, obviously we do know that when there are crimes that happen with money, then often the people who transact with each other are uh, potentially both uh, engaging in something illicit. And yet, on the other hand, you could also be the recipient of funds that were involved in an illicit transaction and have no idea. So, But I actually, I wanted to go back and ask you to expand a little bit more on the philosophy of Grin when you were talking about how it was a breath of fresh air and, and stuff like that, because I do agree that there is something pretty different and, and striking really about Grin's approach. And I, yeah, I want to kind of pull out more of what differentiates Grin from some of the other recent projects. 
Sure. Uh, so, so Grin's mainnet was launched uh, on January 15 uh, this year. And uh, before that, it had been in development for about two and a half years. And from the get-go, it's been done as a completely open source project driven by the community, uh, funded by the community as well. Where any, any development funding received has, has been uh, based on donations. There's been no uh, ICO, there's no pre-mine, there's no dev tax, uh, there's no anything essentially that uh, allocates funds through the protocol layer to uh, the development team. Instead, it's, uh, it was fairly launched, uh, meaning that anybody who wanted could mine it. Uh, it's a proof of work mined coin. And um, it's open for anybody to use. And there is no incentives or no, no special uh, circumstances that benefit early, uh, early adopters or early contributors more than anybody else. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that because I think... I do see how it's inspiring, and yet I also think it has led to some hurdles, I guess I would say, that you guys have faced. Um, but one other thing I wanted to expound upon a little bit was the comparison of Grin to Bitcoin. And, you know, we talked about kind of some of the similarities and also some of the differences. Um, but one thing also that's kind of different is that they seem to have different goals. Bitcoin is now being thought of as a store of value while Grin is aiming to become a medium of exchange. Why did the project decide upon that goal? Uh, okay, well, I think a lot of this refers back to our um, our emission schedule. Now, when we, when we start comparing Grin and Mimblewimble, we have to be a little bit mindful of, sorry, when we're comparing Grin and Bitcoin, we need to be a little bit mindful that you know Bitcoin was launched 10 years ago and was a completely new technology at the time. So, so some of its original kind of its original purposes may not have been what it turned out to be. So, I mean, the paper itself stated that Bitcoin was supposed to be digital cash. Um, since it became clear that the emissions or the, the very limited emission schedule of it, you know, led to, leads to a good amount of, of deflation. Um, the, the story has since been changed to say, no, well, now it's a, now it's a store of value. In our case, in Grin, we very much would like, you know, as a, as Bitcoin was originally meant to do, we would like Grin to be used as a medium of exchange as opposed to a store of value, which is why we've decided on a kind of a very simple emission schedule, as in one one Grin per second, sixty Grins per block, basically forever, instead of having a very limited schedule. So this is something I wanted to ask about because, so obviously the. The emission schedules seem different on the surface because Bitcoin has the 21 million Bitcoin cap, which incentivizes people to get a piece early, like, you know, a Bitcoin or a fraction of a Bitcoin and hold on to that. And that would then drive up the value of all the Bitcoins. So Grin's approach is different because there is no cap, but there's this consistent inflation in perpetuity of one Grin per second. But the thing is that they have the same outcome. Like over time, Grin's emission rate will have the same effect of the block reward havings in Bitcoin. And what I mean by that is in Bitcoin, the inflation was high in the early years. There were 50 new Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And that's when the circulating supply was low. Then it dropped to 25. And then it's now 12.5. Soon it'll be 6.25. And then even though in Grin, there are no havings, the emission rate by staying constant starts out as a high percentage of circulating supply and then eventually just becomes a smaller and smaller percentage over decades, which basically results in it eventually be, being so, somewhat negligible. Um, so in that sense, that's how I'm, how I'm confused. Like, how can Grin go after this medium of exchange goal and try to get people to use it. And and I even saw in your documentation that you believe that this monetary policy will discourage hoarding. But I don't understand how that will happen if the effect of the monetary policies seems to me at least to be the same. Maybe there's just, just something I don't understand. No, no, I think you're right. And I think that's a fair point. I mean, it, it, it's not so much that, you know, there's a halving or there's a limited number. It's that the, the inflation rate is predictable. And so we know how many grins there are in, in circulation now. We can point to 30 years from now and say we know how many there are going to be in then. 
So that that's really what we think the important thing is here. Um, as as far as it, you know, you're right. The 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 inflation rate approaches zero basically. So you get to a point where where you might as well not be minting any more grins because you know there's basically you know no appreciable inflation going on after a while. But but to be honest, honest, um, this I, I, I go ahead, kind of go around saying that the the choices that Grin is making in this regard are very conservative, and you know this is absolutely, as far as I know, the first major coin to do this, as in to not to have a halving and not to have a, a limited emission schedule. So I I don't think we could have gone out there and you know and instead you know created an inflation schedule. I mean, kind of at this point in cryptocurrency development, even what we're doing now is a very, very radical approach, and we hear we hear all sorts about it everywhere we go. So yeah, uh, I was about to say, and it's great that you that you pointed out, Laura, uh, and it, it it really is a conservative approach. And personally, I would have loved to have you know more inflation, but because uh, because these were the kind of the questions I was asking myself as well when I got involved. But the amount of, I think. Like the comments, the commentary on the sidelines and from, from people kind of approaching the project, I think the narrative uh, has a big uh, role to play here. And with, with when Green's emission schedule is, quote unquote, unlimited, it has a lot of uh, effect on people's minds and how they approach the coin. Uh, we've seen that just in the comments. I'm not sure that's going to last and it's going to maintain itself, but it very much, I think, has this effect of thinking that, all right, green is not going to be worth much more. Everybody's kind of saying, oh, it's doomed. You know, the, the value is going to go down so much, uh, which is great, in my opinion, in, in, if you're trying to build uh, electronic cash-like uh, functionality, because then people are not going to think twice about spending it, uh, which is really what's important in order to drive adoption. Uh, I, I would have loved to see, like over time, uh, you know, a much more aggressive inflation. But I think, as Michael was pointing at, this was already a very radical step, apparently, in the space. And uh, uh, I, I think at least we're going in the right direction. And in, in, to, to be fair, also to, to point out, I don't think it would have been possible to to have this if it wasn't for the success of Bitcoin, right? In a way, we're standing on the on the shoulders of Bitcoin, having proven the concept of a of a cryptocurrency to some degree. Uh, and, and I don't think it would have been possible with, with unlimited emission back in 2009. Uh, but because of Bitcoin, we can now take it one step further and say, all right, this is an unlimited emission. Uh, it's still very conservative. Well, one other thing that I was wondering, though, is if you... So essentially, you know, as I pointed out, the inflation rate, the, the way it, or the emission, you know, at least, yeah, you can push this narrative that it's going to be different from Bitcoin. But, you know, like I said, in effect, it, it is pretty much the same. But the other thing is, so with Grin, unlike with Bitcoin, well, no, actually, in this regard, I guess they're sort of similar because somebody needs a Bitcoin address. But but anyway, so to, to send somebody Grin, you know, they have to agree to accept it. But like, who's going to want to accept a new currency if the narrative is that it's going to quickly depreciate? So in that regard, like, how do you plan, you know, if you if your goal is to get medium of exchange, then how are you going to do that? And is there some plan to get stores to accept Grin or like, how, you know, how are you going to, yeah, make this medium of exchange goal happen? Sure. I think I think it's very early days in the in the project's life cycle at this stage where Grin is only a few months old. Uh, so, so this is something that is going to have to take some time to to grow and mature as the ecosystem evolves. There are right now, I would say, the kind of the main use use cases uh, are buying grins and putting them in a wallet, right? Or you mine grins and you have a mining pool and you cash out from the mining pool and either to an exchange or you, you put it back into your wallet. Uh, I think that uh, those use cases are going to be dominating for a while now. Over time, though, uh, because there are there are more grins minted every every day. Every second, there's a new grin uh, put out in circulation. Uh, there's going to be a lot of users holding a lot of grin, and some businesses are going to find that uh, attractive in terms of uh, speaking to like a, an audience uh, where they can sell products to, uh, specifically catering to us because they accept grin. That's one one way of starting to get some early adoption. Uh, another another way that will happen over time once there's a big enough user base. Or even the other way around, it could also be, is is for 
businesses and individuals who have needs to transact privately, right? And this will drive adoption. And it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't matter much whether there's a, a depreciating pressure on the green assets themselves, if you're able to transact with them and then easily uh, cash in or out to another currency like like Bitcoin, for example. Yeah, so I guess we'll see because obviously Bitcoin has the most traction out of any coin. And so maybe, so that could simply be the main selling point is, uh, you know, in order to use this for transaction is transactions is that it's like Bitcoin, but private. <laughs> um, no, well, absolutely. Yes. And, yeah, sorry, I was just, just pointing out there, you can say it's like Bitcoin and then private. But I mean, we do have some, you know, technologies coming out, like, um, for instance, the ability to do a, atomic swaps, swaps with Bitcoin, uh, which we have. So there, there, there is also the use case of using kind of Mimblewimble or using, sorry, the, the Grin blockchain as kind of a, a way to, to further privatize Bitcoin transactions, as in someone does a transaction in Bitcoin, then does an atomic swap with Grin, and then a swap back, and then there's, you know, a greater level of, of privacy there. Huh. Yeah, so let's actually talk more about the privacy feature features of Grin. What are the different ways that the protocol enables privacy? Okay, sure. Well, there, there's a few... There's a few different things. First off, um, amounts on the blockchain are completely obfuscated. Transaction structure by the time it gets to the blockchain is is obfuscated or compressed. Basically, when I look at you can, I mean, you can try this now. If you look at a, at a Grin blockchain explorer and you look at the data that's in the in each block, there's basically there's nothing there identifying it. It, it, it basically looks like random data, and that's down to kind of the the, the mathematical trickery. That happens uh, with Mimblewimble. Um, so instead of you know having one transaction, you know one signature per output, you kind of have everything kind of put together, amalgamated into kind of one one very compact block, so to speak. And why don't you talk also a little bit about like CoinJoin, confidential transactions, the Dandelion Protocol, some of the other features? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so I mean the dandelion pro- dandelion protocol itself. I mean that's that's not uh, specific to Mimblewimble in particular. That's something that's kind of on top, and that's that's what it, that does is it's meant to to hide the transaction graph. So if I'm say you know a three letter agency and I have I'm able to monitor you know a good portion of the network, um, I can see you know where transactions went or if, if a transaction was suddenly broadcast to all its peers, um, I should be I could potentially get a good idea of, you know, what machine that transaction came from. So Dandelion attempts to, to obfuscate that a bit. So instead of, you know, when a node receives a transaction, it doesn't broadcast to all its peers, but it will send it off to another node, which will send it off to another node at random. And that's called the stem phase, which is why it's called Dandelion. So one, one node to another node to another node. And then randomly at some point, one of the nodes will say, right, and we'll have the, the, the fluff phase where all of the, you know, that, particular node will, will broadcast the transaction to all its known peers. So by doing that, um, you've kind of, you've obfuscated the path. If you get a transaction, you're a node and you get a transaction, it's not necessarily obvious where it came from. And that's what Dandelion is is supposed to do. Other features. Um, CoinJoin is kind of built into it. Um, it. There's not like, you know, the, the Coin join in Bitcoin is a bit different, but we kind of use use the term a little bit, just kind of more for for clarity of explanation. What happens is is because in a, a Mimblewimble transaction, it's not about signing individual outputs. It's kind of a, it's about putting all of the inputs and outputs in a single transaction together and making sure they sum to zero, right? So when you if you can do that, you have a, a notion of something else that's called cut through, which we talked about, where we kind of touched on a bit earlier. So if all your, your inputs and outputs in a transaction equal zero, well, surely you can start cutting out some of these outputs kind of on either side of the equation. So I could potentially do do a transaction that involves, you know, certain inputs and then without any confirmation, do another one and another one. And that can cut out, you know, the transactions that happened in the middle. And that's that's the notion of cut through. And again, that that goes towards adding some some privacy. And that's like if I send you a payment and let's say it's for 10 grin and then part of the inputs that were used well actually so how would this work 
So, okay, so let's say that um, I sent you 10 grin and then you turn around and you send 10 grin to Daniel. Then um, essentially what will happen is the cut through will make it look like I just sent 10 to Daniel directly. Is that right? Yeah, it, it will cut out the middle ones, uh, as you as you say. Um, and again, when you say look like it, just, there's, there's nothing that appears in the chain that identifies you or ties you to a particular address. So it just gives you an extra layer of, of kind of obfuscation. Yeah, and we should say that <clears throat> there are no addresses even. Uh, and the only thing that are on the chain are, are these outputs and inputs. Uh, some linkability is, is possible to do there, you know, because, you know, w- one, one output in one transaction is then being used as an input in a, in a future transaction. But it makes it much harder to build up a, a valid transaction graph. Uh, and, and especially like monitoring the network if you're if you're in an analysis firm, but it's not perfect, uh, and we have still a long long way to go, and and we're we're kind of constantly looking to make improvements, and don't feel like we're finished in terms of obfuscating uh, data and and making the chain more private. I think yeah, it's good, probably a cat and mouse type of thing. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know already we're we're like we're well on our way, uh, given what we're doing already as described and the fact that it's enabled by default for everybody on on the chain right so a big a big part of privacy is hiding in crowds uh and uh, amongst your peers and uh, because this is enabled by default on the core protocol anybody that using uh grin is essentially making it harder for uh f- for uh for privacy to be leaked we're going to talk more about this concept of having no addresses in grin in a moment But first, a quick word from our fabulous sponsors. Face it, regulations can stall or kill a fast-moving crypto business. New FAFT and EU cryptocurrency AML laws are coming soon. You could be hit with stiff fines or blacklisted, no matter where your servers are in the world. Prepare now. Deploy the same powerful cipher trace tools used by regulators. Protect your assets. Streamline your compliance programs. And keep your exchange or crypto business out of the regulator's crosshairs. Learn how effective anti-money laundering tools help keep your crypto business safe and trusted. Learn more at cyphertrace.com slash unchained. Cyphertrace is securing the crypto economy. Back to my conversation about Grin with Daniel and Michael. So as you mentioned, there are no addresses in Grin. This is yet another reason I was so fascinated by this technology. So how do people send each other money then? How do I send Grin to somebody if I don't have an address or, or addresses that I call my own? Okay, so you're right. There are there are no addresses in Grin. Um, what all you have basically is is a, a wallet, which is essentially you know a private key or a system for generating private keys um, that give you permission to spend outputs that are on the chain. So in order to build a transaction, there's a there's an interactive element in the protocol, as in I have to send some data over to the person I'm transacting with, who has to do something to it, and then send it back and then post it to the chain. So it's, it's I mean, from a cryptographic standpoint, it's it's known as an, an interactive protocol, as in two parties have to transact with or interact with each other rather in order to create the transaction. And the and the key kind of part of that then means that uh, this has to happen through some communications channel, but it could be uh, any communications channel that the the sender and the receiver uh, chooses to use. It could be a private chat. It could be uh, you know a written message. Uh, it, it could be any form of communication that allows the sender to interact with the receiver once and then the receiver to send information back to the sender. Uh, and that's it. And then that, that can be finalized and broadcast to the chain. Yeah, this was another thing that I thought was so interesting. Like there's something about this architecture that reminds me a little bit of email in the sense that the protocol makes the transaction possible. But then there are many ways you could execute it. So like with email, you know, you could use your own email server or you could use Gmail. And um, so for Grin, what are the different ways in which people can execute Grin transactions? Oh, okay. Well, just, just a little bit of technical explanation. Um, the, the absolute simplest way to send someone a transaction in the core, just kind of on the Mimblewimble protocol itself, is you send them, you know, a, a transaction or a partial transaction. And this would contain some private keys that are needed in order to spend the output. And the other person puts that together with theirs and creates a transaction. So that's the simplest way to do it. 
But that obviously involves the sender revealing private keys, which causes all sorts of other problems. So we don't do that. So in, in Grin itself, we built we have something on top of that for doing a transaction exchange, and it's it uses Schnorr signatures, and it requires one back and forth. So from the say this the sender to the receiver and back in order to, you know, for either party to build up a Schnorr signature. So we can we can put together kind of the, the final signature without any one party having to reveal the keys to anybody else. So the short so you know from a practical standpoint, what comes out of that is the shortest way to form a transaction is from sender to receiver and back to sender. And already kind of within the, the core software that we have, um, there's a few ways of doing that. So obviously the the, the kind of most maybe intuitive way of doing this would be uh, via HTTP, so somebody runs a listener on their wallet, and that's listening for for senders to send money to the wallet directly. So that's an HTTP listener. The sender will send an HTTP request, and then the response will contain the rest of the info to create the signature, and then the the sender can create the final transaction and post that to the chain. We also have a, a method of doing that via email, so you can send a file to somebody. So you in your wallet, you generate your send file. You send that to the recipient and, you know, at their leisure, they receive it, import it, so to speak, into the wallet and then send the result back to the sender to finalize it and put it onto the chain. Um, and again, you know, the, the, the actual number of ways you can do this from a technology standpoint are, you know, infinite. We have, there's an experimental key base adapter, so, you know, key base users can send, send to, you know, other key base users on the system. So, yeah, I mean, we'll probably talk a bit more about later of what we're doing to, to facilitate these kinds of transactions because our approach is, like I said, Grin is trying to be non-prescriptive. So instead of saying, you know, providing one way of doing these, met these the, the transaction, we want to kind of provide the tools to enable the community to come up with, you know, the best or most appropriate ways to perform this transaction. And isn't there a way to do it with paper as well? Uh you could, you could you could write everything down on a piece of paper and send it to somebody and they can type it all back in. But um, yeah, absolutely. You can meet someone with a dark alley and a wad of paper and say, you know, here's your grins. And, uh, and my, you know, uh, part, of, uh, part of a team that I'm involved with, we've uh, also developed a system called Grimbox, which allows you to, uh, it, it's essentially like an inbox for, for your grins. It's funny that you, that you, um, use the email analogy before Laura. Uh, so everybody gets an address, but the address is not, is not stored on chain or anything. It's derived from your, your private seed. And then you can exchange messages through the, through a relay of servers, uh, that are federated just like email. Uh, and all these messages are end to end encrypted so that only the sender and the receiver can actually, uh, be privy to the information of the slates. Uh, it, but, but it's essentially, an example of how we uh, envisage layer two solutions to deliver different solutions of the problem of exchanging message information and building these transactions rather than on the core protocol layer saying, all right, this is the one way to best do this. Instead, uh, you know, it's encouraged that many different uh, approaches are experimented with and kind of the one, the one that works best is, is going to be the one that, that gets a lot of usage. And then one other thing that I was just thinking about was with Bitcoin, a lot of people have said that you could do kind of like um, fundraising for disaster recovery and, and stuff like that. You know, people could publicize their Bitcoin address and then people can just push that out. But is that like earlier, Michael, when you were talking about how um, you could use HTTP, that's always just listening. Is that a way that that kind of crowdfunding could happen as well using Grin? Uh, yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we do have an example of that going for our for our own fundraising efforts. I believe there's a there's an HTTP address that can that anyone can can send Grins to with their wallets. And then for this round trip communication that needs to occur to make a transaction happen. Obviously, we know that ransomware has been a huge trend with Bitcoin where, you know, they hijack your computer or whatever and demand you pay them in Bitcoin. Does the setup of Grin make that any either easier or harder? Or I'm not sure how that would affect that trend. Um, that's a good question. That's not really something I've, I've thought about. 
Now, the, I mean, the people who use Bitcoin as ransomware are, you know, are, are not necessarily the cleverest people in the world because using Bitcoin leaves a, a, a massive trail behind as to where you are. You know, the min- I'd say the minute someone tries to actually spend that Bitcoin, there'll be, there'll be people all over them. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm not really sure. Um, in a sense, you know, if they, if they say, here's my HTTP listener, I mean, they could be, could be doing this through Tor as well. So, yeah, it could be, it could be quite difficult to track them as well. So, yeah, it's interesting. It's not really something I've, I've thought about too much. Huh, okay. I guess if they take control of your computer and then, yeah, initiate the transaction and you want to get the computer back, you would need to complete it. But then maybe it's actually worse because then since it's private, the ransomware people will will like grin better than Bitcoin actually. Yeah, I also didn't know the answer to that when I asked it, but just thinking it through right now. All right, yeah, well, I mean, we... I, there, are, there, are many, there are many use cases for uh, private transactions that are maybe negative, but there are also many positive use cases for private transactions and a need uh, for private transactions in general. Uh, and it seems like um, the example that you raised, uh, if we've established that ransomware uh, is, is possible today and it's widely used and it works well with Bitcoin, I don't think it makes um, a big difference to the to the spread of ransomware with a technology like Grin. Maybe they switch to it, maybe not. But it seems like they've been able to to do their uh, carry out their business uh, regardless today quite well. Yeah, and I know it's so early in the life of Grin, but do you have any sense yet of whether criminals are interested in this form of money? Because for people who've listened to my previous episodes with fluffy pony of Monero and Zuko of Zcash. Um, I did ask them a little bit about how they felt about the fact that their cryptocurrencies did um, make crimes easier. I don't know. I mean, I mean, uh, it's kind of like with the, the, the Fed, the, you know, criminals use cash as well. And I'm not sure, uh, you know, what the Fed thinks about that uh, I, i'm sure the fed is m- much more uh you know focused on kind of the wider economy uh than specific individual use cases for 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 how cash is being used i, I like to think of grin as, as quite agnostic in that sense uh and the protocol itself is not opinionated about use cases uh, it shouldn't be uh, just like cash doesn't really care how it's being used it's just functional uh, and then uh, there might be some individuals or organizations that are using cash in a way that breaks the law. Uh, and I definitely think governments and regulators should care about that. But it's not up to to the transaction method itself to do that. Yeah. So let's also now kind of uh, apply the same thinking to the uh, just, you know, the general uses for the technology. So we've been talking about how, you know, this protocol or or Grin requires this like round trip communication to make a transaction happen. And in the Bitcoin world or in the crypto world in general, a lot of people have talked about how legacy systems are pull technology, meaning, uh, you know, you have to hand over your information and then the store or whatever that wants the payment from you has to contact your bank and request that that money. And that pull technology is sort of prone to fraud. And then people have been talking about how Bitcoin is a push technology where you control the money and like cash, you decide when the money gets sent out from your address. And that, of course, then puts the burden on users to not lose their private keys. So in this case where Mimblewimble is like different, how would you, how do you think it will affect behaviors around money and what kinds of financial problems do you think could happen or, you know, sort of like the push pull thing, or do you think that it sort of resolves all kinds of issues with that? I think it actually improves a bit on, on the model uh, uh, with Bitcoin from a practical perspective of uh, accepting payments from users. Uh, again, kind of thinking on in the context from like a, from like a business, one of the problems or challenges, I should say, with accepting Bitcoin is that users are prone to do uh, a lot of errors and mistakes. And by having this interactive protocol where uh, it, it, basically in order for you to receive a green transaction, you have to actively 
uh, get involved uh, in order to process it, which means that it's not possible for somebody to just send money to you to an address of yours in the blind, uh, like a HTTP address or something. You actually have to actively respond and send information back to the sender, which means that it's very easy to reject transactions, which allows transaction flows to be more robust in a way. So you don't have this issue of some user sending uh, address to an address they shouldn't be doing, and now you have to figure out what happened and return the funds back to them. Or if some unauthorized person is sending you cash, which might sound a bit strange, but you know a lot of businesses actually uh, are very careful about making sure that they only receive payments that they're supposed to do to receive. Otherwise, their their bookkeeping doesn't add up. With Grin, it becomes easier to do so because you can basically run checks and validate that indeed you're you're supposed to receive this payment and otherwise reject it. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the other features of Grin. So Grin does not have something called scripting, which uh, Bitcoin has. So what are some examples of things you can do with scripts in Bitcoin, but not in Grin? But then I, I, you know, uh, Michael, I think also did mention now you guys still have features like atomic swaps. And I think there are a few others. So what are some of the other features that you were still able to retain anyway? Right. So, I mean, atomic swap is one example. Um, there, there's something that's been kicking around in, in member Wimble circles with the notion of script to script. And what that means is it, it means kind of cryptographic tricks um, that you can do to enable kind of script like functionality without actually having to go through, you know, without actually having to include a script. So um, one example of that, I mean, and again, this is all kind of theoretical stuff that we kind of have on a list for research, a lot of it, um, stuff like lightning, we, we think we'd be able to enable that at some point after some research um, using kind of script to script tricks. Um, there's the atomic swaps that we mentioned. There's, um, you know, time locked, relative time locked transactions, um, vaults, which, you know, add more kind of user level security. Um, so like a meaning lot of like, things... Like meaning if I want to do a transaction for a large amount or something, then there's a delay built in so that people can't rob me. Is yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And if someone tries to, then, you know, there's a case where nobody gets the money. So there's, there's, there's less incentive for people to even try it in the first place. And so what are scriptless scripts? So first of all, let's, can you describe what scripting is and then what scriptless scripts are? I, I think in terms of saying what scriptless scripts are, it, it, it's not as if there's a, you know, it's just a scriptless script is a particular anything. It's more of a, more of a trick that's done um, to enable something you could do with the script. So um, for instance, you know, at a, at a kind of mathematical level, there, it would be some trickery about, you know, adding one to something or using the number one in kind of creative ways. So I, you couldn't point to, you know, a set of things and say, these are scriptless scripts. It's, it's very much about, you know, tricks to enable, to enable scripting like behavior. And scripting is a way of making Bitcoin programmable. Yeah. It's basically a smart, some, some very basic smart contract functionality. Yeah. And in Bitcoin, like, I mean, I don't think it's used all that extensively of the kind of the standard exchange script. Um, stuff like you'd see, you know, Ethereum, you know, the biggest use case for Ethereum is, is, is to have, you know, a smart contract enablement or the ability to develop smart contracts. Unfortunately, that doesn't fit in with the Mimblewimble protocol because it's such a kind of compact form of a blockchain that there's no room for it anywhere. Yeah. And so uh, and, and the, the, kind of, the notion and concept of scriptless scripts is attributed to Andrew Polstra, who uh, was doing Mimblewimble research early on and just basically allows you to implement some simple uh, smart contract functionality that is off chain in a way. Uh, and you don't need to base it. It's you don't only check uh, signatures are present and correct. And it's derived through using Schnorr signatures. And what are Schnorr signatures? Uh, a Schnorr signature is is basically it, it's a multi multi user signature. So I, I can I can sign something, uh, or sorry, I can create a signature for something, and someone else can create a signature for the same thing, and we can combine the two signatures together. You can basically add them together to get kind of one signature that's taken from all the kind of partial signatures involved. So it's 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 how we do the. Um, their basic transaction in, in Grin at the moment is instead of everyone revealing private keys, I just sign a part signature with my private keys and the other person signs 
part of, of their partial signature with their private keys. And then when you put that all together, um, you can you can add the public keys and then the public keys will be able to verify the signature. So my the added private keys equals the, the added public keys and it all works as if it was just one person created the signature. And if you do scriptless scripts, you're basically, or adapter signatures as they call it, you're basically in a way hacking this by putting some you know these signatures the private uh, information could be could be random but you could also um, make you know p- put in some deliberate information that then can be used I- in your kind of off chain smart contract in your quotes let's talk about your launch what were some of the different features of your launch and why did you choose those features okay so i i think the um, the notion of like a fair launch in the sense that there wasn't any pre mine or or dev tax or uh, any kind of design around uh, incent- uh, incentivizing or rewarding uh, development team. I think that was taken quite early in the project. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with just keeping things simple and straightforward and also making things fair and transparent. Uh, and uh, it wasn't, it's, it's just, you know, in a way, I think, you know, the more I've kind of been involved in the project, the more I think about it, it's it's what really makes sense. Uh, if if you're looking at the big picture and thinking about what the end goal is, uh, if the end goal is to you know get funded and, and have a little small development team working on a project, you probably would do it in a different way. But if you're trying to build a, almost something that could be a public good, and you want to see like big picture, long game thinking, and want to enable a, like a healthy and thriving ecosystem uh, surrounding your project, you need to allow equal access to getting involved and make it as easy as possible. And because uh, there's no incentives for me to kind of, I'm not getting rewarded if more people are joining the project or not. And uh, as, as a relatively, I, I guess I'm a relatively early uh, user, but if somebody chooses to get involved in, in green today, they have the same uh, um, conditions as I, I do. And it, it makes it very easy to contribute because you're not feeling that when you're contributing that somebody else is profiting uh, as a result of that. And it also allows us as a group uh, and as a community to be very open and honest about, about the project itself. We're not necessarily selling anything because we, we have nothing to sell and we have no upside from it either. And, uh, and I think that that is great in the sense that it keeps us very honest and it allows also a community to build uh, around the project. Well, so then how do you feel about the fact that in the end, the early miners were these like special purpose investment vehicles devoted to mining Grin and they were funded by, uh, I guess people were saying $100 million in VC money. Sure. I mean, that may be the case. I, I haven't seen the $100 million uh, attributed to it. The When I've been speaking to some groups and individuals, it seems like a lot of the investment vehicles uh, didn't uh, participate in mining uh, immediately. I don't know if they're doing it now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, mining happening in China, but generally speaking, equal opportunity doesn't equal does, doesn't mean equal outcome. Uh, you know, if, if there were, we welcome everybody to to use Grin, to mine Grin, and to participate in the project. Now, if there were uh, groups uh, that felt that the project was really exciting and they really wanted to mine grin and they wanted to devote a lot of uh, resources into doing that then they're free to do that and i guess that's just good in general we're an open project and and again we don't really think about these things too much uh i don't really see it as an issue necessarily and how did notions of fairness play a role in your decision to have those two different consensus algorithms with one of them becoming more dominant over time Right. So, so uh, just some background first, and uh, before I go into answer that, Green is proof of work mind, as we said, and uh, there are two proofs of work. Uh, they're all from the same family of, of proof of works called the Cuckoo Cycle uh, family, uh, which was created by John Trump, uh, which is also part of the core, core team of Green. Uh, and uh, we have we launched with two different algorithms, two variations of that of the Cuckoo Cycle family. The, the first one is specifically tuned for ASIC manufacturing and uh, make it, making it as easy as possible to develop ASICs for it. And ASICs and, are like specialized chips that can be uh, built specifically to mine GRIN. 
Exactly. Uh, uh, there, or specifically, there are, specifically to do anything, but then you could have ones that are grin. A, a, exactly. Focused, so yeah. GP, GPU is a type of ASIC, but it's a very generalized uh, type of ASICs. Uh, but you can also make a specialized ASIC that only does one thing really, really well and efficiently. Uh, for example, mining this uh, uh, KUKA2 ASIC tuned algorithm. Uh, so that's one of the proof of works. The second proof of work is uh, ASIC resistant, meaning that it's designed to be uh, more GPU friendly uh, and incentivize GPU mining uh, rather than something to develop ASICs for. And when we launched, the reward for the ASIC tuned uh, proof of work uh, was 10%, and the reward for the ASIC resistant proof of work was 90%, meaning that. 90% on average of all rewards would go to uh, the miners who are mining the GPU-friendly uh, proof of work. And this, over time, uh, the balance here between 10% and 90% changes linearly up until the second, uh, once Green has a two-year anniversary, it will switch to being completely 100% on the ASIC-tuned proof of work. So what we're saying is that we bootstrap the network, uh, giving a heavier weight towards the GPU-friendly algorithm. And then over time, there will only be rewards after two years uh, for the ASIC-tuned uh, algorithm. And the logic for that is that essentially, the, there was when, when Grin was in development, we noticed that there was heavy, uh, a lot of attention being put to, put to the project. And there were already, we heard rumors of ASICs being uh, manufactured and, and, and so on. And, and we were worried about the decentralization of the network. And a way to bootstrap the network was basically to, to devise this dual proof of work system, which is only temporary, in a way to uh, increase the decentralization and also not incentivize one or two big ASIC manufacturers with a lot of resources to kind of jump the queue and have an ASIC miner ready from day one and take control of all the hash power on the network, but instead to have a gradual increase of this uh, ASIC-friendly uh, proof of work, and as a result, build a healthy, hopefully, hopefully healthy ASIC ecosystem where you have many different ASIC manufacturers competing and offering products to the market. And let's also go back to um, some of the comments you guys made earlier about how Grin does not have a dev tax, meaning that part of the block reward does not go to the developers. And so, uh, for instance, especially like I know you, uh, Michael, who, you know, you go by the, the name Yeast Plume, you were trying to raise funds for, uh, to pay for, you know, your time on developing Grin from the community. And um, I saw that uh, at first, at least, the campaign was not going very well. You weren't even trying to raise like a huge sum of money. And I think it was like, what was it, 55 pounds per year? or Sorry, 55,000 pounds a year? No, it was, it was, it was a, 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 a period. Uh, uh, the rate, actually, that we're, we're using now is about 9,000 euro. So I say around 10,000 USD would kind of be our standard, what, we've, what we standardized on a as month. A, you know, a month of developer's time, yeah. Yeah, and, and that, I mean that obviously I... includes includes taxes we have to pay when I was. So it's like a the the salary payment basically that we'd get. Yeah, and at first I think you were only raised like roughly a fifth or something, and then ignored. Sorry, keep going. You no, know, no, you're you're right about that, but that that was that was also the fourth time, the fourth campaign as well. So I mean, the I I've been working full time on Grin since about uh, since February of last year. And since then, I've, I've done four funding campaigns, and all of which were successful. Some of them, I mean, the first one was in the height of the um, the Bitcoin bubble. So everyone was feeling wealthy. And I, and I mean, that, that campaign was funded in about, in about two days. Um, the next one took a bit longer. The next one took a bit longer. The last one, which was done uh, just around launch, it's it stalled a little bit. But also, there were there are a lot of companies out there who've pledged to support Grid over the long term, as in... You know, put you know a mining pool might decide to give a, a donation of their proceeds into the Grin General Development Fund. I think a lot of that was kind of being set up as well at the same time. So up until now, I mean, the community has been absolutely great. I mean, they've been very supportive and have you know have allowed me to be able to to work on this full time. 
Oh, but actually, uh, because that one at fundraising attempt at least did not go very well, I know that Ignotus uh, wrote a post expressing his or their disappointment with the lack of funding for for your work. And they also talked about greed in the crypto community. But I just wonder, you know, another looked at another way, it could also be seen as a problem of incentives. And I, like, do you feel like if you were to do it again, would you try to raise funds a different way that kind of harnesses incentives more? Uh, okay. I mean, I, I don't think trying to, to I, I don't think raising money is inherently evil or structuring yourself in such a way that, that, you know, injecting capital into your project, however you want to do it, is not necessarily a bad thing. As, as a matter of fact, as we can see, you know, it's, it's challenging to do things the way we we're doing it. But I mean, this wouldn't necessarily be true for all projects that, you know, I ever work on ever, but in this case with Rain, I mean, it's the first implementation of Mimblewimble. And and we think if, you know, if the project is run in such a way that it, it's it's obviously to benefit a small group of people, even if it's just, you know, for, uh, you know, supposedly just to pay developers and nothing else, um, it still kind of diminishes from the, the, the notion of Grin belonging to everybody. If, if there's a dev tax and developers are only paid out of the, the dev tax, there's much less incentive for other developers to come along and join, um, you know, and make, you know, contributions as you would to an open source project because, you know, they're all getting paid out of it. I'm not, why would I do this? So it's, it, it's, it's challenging. It's not the only answer, but it's, it, I mean, it's the one that Grin, it's kind of the path that Grin has chosen and, you know, we intend to stick to it. Yeah. And I mean, I've been, I've been kind of called a f- fanatic or incredibly naive when I, when I say it, but you know, the way I've been thinking about it, I don't really see, another way of doing it that makes sense essentially i think this is it's hard uh we're we're not we're very frugal uh which i also think is a good thing uh and you know raising money in a different way uh, while you solve the funding problem perhaps you also open up the door for a bunch of other problems as uh, michael was saying you know other developers might be less incentivized to join if they're not getting paid uh how do you allocate funds uh, how um, how do you handle all this administration of, you know, it's one thing, we have some administration now for the modest funds that we receive in donation, but it becomes a completely different game if you're having hundreds of thousands or millions even of, of dollars that you're supposed to administer and, and do it in the right way. And how do you ensure that funds get allocated to the right place, that they're used efficiently, and that all of this ultimately is actually benefiting your long-term goal? Uh, it, it's it's not obvious, and I don't think actually it's been proven in the space that having more money uh, yields to better results. I haven't actually seen a single example of that at this stage. Yeah, this is one of those things where when you look at it one way, you know, you can see kind of one side and look at it another way, you see the other side. I, I definitely, <laughs> maybe because, you know, we, we've seen uh, that socialism maybe hasn't worked out super well in a lot of places. Um, and maybe it's because, you know, growing up here in the US, uh, you kind of see like, okay, here's how capitalism works. And you sort of think, okay, it works well. But at the same time, you can live in a capitalist society and sort of kind of be into minimalism and be like, well, I don't want to <laughs> buy a ton of things all the time, because that's not a very satisfying way to live. So I, I, yeah, I just I look at it. And I kind of go back and forth you know i do there is something it's like i was i I don't want to talk i don't want to mention who this person was but i was talking with somebody about zcash and about the uh the developer rewards that that they have and you know that person kind of had a view that was like negative on the creator's earning money from it. And I was a little bit confused at first. I just thought, well, they created it. They should be rewarded. But, you know, I know what you're talking about. If you're trying to build something that's for the community, it's just that, like I said, when I see also that then you struggle a little bit to raise funds for the development, uh, it just makes me wonder, well, like, could it have been done better? But anyway, as for your points, I actually wanted to expound on that a little bit more. You decided not to do a foundation for the governance of Grin. Why not? And how do you guys plan to govern Grin? Right. And so so one of the early contributions I did was to have a look at foundations and do some re- research around that and see what the use cases for foundations are and w- how they apply to Grin in the context and whether we, 
we should have one or not. And as I was going through it, I couldn't really find any compelling arguments to why you would need a foundation, especially if you're trying to be decentralized. Uh, the, I think the, the main point maybe was to protect the trademark, uh, to have like a, an entity that uh, registers a trademark and protects it. But we really didn't see any point in trying to enforce that even. And otherwise, I don't really see the the, the use case for it as an official, I'm doing these air quotes again, but like as an official foundation, it becomes this centralizing entity, which now needs uh, administration and organization, they need a bureaucracy for it. And, uh, and then this centralized foundation is going to be making uh, decisions. And, you know, even if you only support or fund uh, projects, et cetera, you're, you're effectively, you're doing, you're, you're taking these decisions and it creates structure where I'm not sure it actually adds any benefit. In the research, however, we did conclude that, you know, foundations are great in the sense that if other people want to put together a foundation and say, you have a, a passionate individual uh, that really wants to further green development and say, hey, I'm going to put together a, a green foundation now. I'm going to create the structure and I'm going to give it a grant and I hand out uh, money to development projects that are uh, targeting green. That's great. Uh, we encourage it. We encourage many foundations to be founded uh, on the, these prin- principles. However, there won't be an official foundation. And uh, rather instead, and how, how like green, green's governance has evolved, uh, has instead been uh, from from having just Ignotus as the, the main founder and individual who, or group entity, a bunch of robots, nobody really knows who Ignotus is or are, uh, but now also having a, a, a technocratic council that uh, essentially was created for the main, the, the main purpose was to manage the multisig key where funds, donations are being kept. So essentially, the moment you start accepting donations and funds, you create a layer of hierarchy. I think it's in a way inevitable. You can't really do it in a different way aside if you you start like going into you know governance research like uh, distributed autonomous organizations and so on, which mm-hmm. I think is very much unproven. It's very difficult. We we want to stay focused on really uh, you know working on Grin and uh, and not try to overcomplicate things. Uh, so, so instead, there's this, this subset of individuals, nine, nine people, Michael and I are part of them, that um, are part of kind of initially was, was part of managing the keys. Uh, but the general way of how governance decisions are being made today is in a very transparent fa- fashion where we have biweekly meetings. Uh, so every other week, there's a development related meeting. And the other week, there's a governance uh, focused meeting. and Anybody's free to add points to the agenda, and these will be discussed in the meeting, which is, are happening on our Gitter chat. Everybody's free to, to, to join in, and the points are discussed and, and decisions are being made out in the open in a transparent fashion. And the philosophy, I think, in general is to just keep things minimal, minimal and transparent and open as far as we can and, and, and as, uh, for as long as we can. And if there's no reason to change it, we wouldn't want to do that. All right. So let's close out with one last question. Since launch, which was not that long ago, what are some of the things you guys have been working on and what can we expect from Grin going forward? Sure. Well, um, as I've I've talked about a little bit earlier, um, what we're trying to do is is, uh, support the community in building tools on top of Grin. So uh, from from my my perspective, anyhow, I'm doing a lot of work on the the wallet software itself. But rather than trying to create, you know, the nicest GUI wallet there is, I'm spending all of my time focused on putting out, you know, an API or a set of tools for other developers to pick up and build, you know, their their fancy GUI wallets on top of. So um, in one sense, it's very much, you know, support the community and, you know, let them come up with with solutions to some of the problems we've talked about and experiment and, and see what happens from there. On top of that, I mean, we have some of the additions to the core protocol that we've talked about. And I I kind of describe this as very kind of careful and considered introduction of new technologies into Grin. Because um, while we have a long list of things that we think we know how to do, uh, we can't guarantee, you know, when we're going to kind of have all the the research worked out in order to be able to enable them. So we'll be kind of slowly and measuredly adding features to, to, you know, the core Grin protocol as we go. 
one of the things I'm I'm very much excited about is the recent um, work by Ignotus to uh, see the, and explore the potential of uh, I2P integration on onto Grin and uh, support a more anonymous uh, uh, peer-to-peer network. Yeah, yeah. I think you guys have a very, very, very interesting project. Um, so we will have to check back in to see what happens. I will thank you both so much for joining us today. Where can people learn more about you and Grin? Thank you, Laura. Uh, if you want to learn more about Grin, uh, a good place to start is uh, on our website, uh, grin-tech.org. Uh, there's also a Grin newsletter every week that I curate. And uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can always do so via Keybase or Twitter, uh, at Lenberg. And Michael, do you have a Twitter handle? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, it would be at Yeastplume is my Twitter handle. And again, if someone really wants to find me, it's very easy to do so, either through through the, our Gitter channel or, or the forum anything anything grim related i should be able you should be able to find me there anyhow yeah and i should also add that you know if you have questions you want to find out more about grin join the gator channel the community is very welcoming and receptive for anyone and and um you know get involved all right great well thanks so much for coming on unchained thank you laura thank you for having us Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Grin, Daniel, and Michael, check out the show notes inside your podcast player. If you are not yet signed up for my email newsletter, go to unchainedpodcast.com right now to get my thoughts on the top crypto stories of the week, plus a preview of exclusive podcast content. And be sure to check us out on YouTube. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Raylan Gallopoli, Fraxion Recording, Jenny Josephson, Daniel Ness, and Rich Strappolito. Thanks for listening.